landed in Fresno, California, and I can, I was just thinking about this a little while ago, the movie Mrs. Doubtfire, when the, when the guy across from him said, start your engines, and they were drinking straight whiskey. So I knew I was home. I was already, I already half lit when I landed in Fresno. So I, I can remember going out to greet the family, and one of the family members took me aside and handed me a handful, probably three or four, what they called whites back in the day. And that's a substitute word for speed. And it's it's a just a horrific drug. But anyway, start your engines. Boy, did my life change the minute I touched ground after Vietnam. I think that's when my trials really began. And so anyway, I needed a place to live, obviously. So my friend Rick, my brother-in-law's brother, he said, hey, I'm a carpenter. You can come and live with me. We have an apartment and we, we'll do piece work and we'll do construction and we'll do framing. And I said, I don't know how to frame. He says, oh, we'll teach you. All, all it is is tough, tough work, and, but it's easy to learn. So I said, well, I don't have anywhere to live. So we're high as a kite. So I ended up at Rick's house and began to live there because I had nowhere else to live. No income from anything. I had a little money, probably $800 leaving the military. That's about all I had. And so I can remember we began to frame houses. The problem was we got addicted to them whites I was talking about. And so we would go to work on this speed and we would work all day long. It seemed like 140 degrees like Vietnam because the sun would reflect off them subfloors. And man, it, it was hot and tough work. I was young though, and, and the speed made you feel like you were King Kong. So I can remember we would work so hard and we'd come home and we'd fall asleep with our nail bags on. We wouldn't even get in bed. And the twilight would come and we'd wake up and we'd think it was time to go to work again. And we'd have to, we'd have to figure it out. Oh, we just got home, time to go back to sleep. So everything was just a party. I mean, we drank booze, we took every kind of drug you can take, and we really got heavy into the drugs. Well, I had a party, basically what you do after you come home from a war, about uh, probably a week after I was living with Rick, and I was gonna meet my old high school girlfriend. And remember, she wrote me a letter in Vietnam said she was pregnant by somebody else. Well, I called her and she said, yeah, I'll come to the party. So she comes to the party and, you know, we both had changed. I mean, it had been a year and a half or whatever. And she'd been through a lot and I'd been through some stuff. And so it didn't work out. I was so, so dysfunctional, so irresponsible and so young. Uh, you know, she she wanted me to raise that kid is what she wanted. And so I kind of would date her every once in a while. And then she, she had the baby. And I can remember the last time I saw her, one of the last times I saw her, uh, I went to take her out on a date and she said, come in and see my baby. And of course I was so full of pride and uh, that was not real to me. I said, no, nah, that's okay, let's go type of thing. And her whole plan was to get me to come in the house and get to know her baby. And so all that would work out. And I remember I had a six pack in my car <laughs> and I told her, see ya. I just took off because I was into me. I mean, I had so many issues from Vietnam, I couldn't even count them all. So I just got in my car and took off. And I remember drinking and driving, just drinking. I was so angry. And now that I'm older, I feel so bad that it, you know, it'd be a miracle if I could see her again and tell her how sorry I was because I was about me, had nothing to do with her. Probably crushed her, you know, she ended up getting married, I know. But anyway, go back to the house with Rick. We had, uh, back in the day, the 60s, the, ce the whole ceiling was beer caps and they were different colors painted. And there were like thousands of them we would save to decorate our apartment. And back then we had this, this lights in my eye right now, but back then it was kind of like them, they had black lights. Your t-shirt would light up, your teeth. It was just really weird, these black lights. And so the whole ceiling would light up with this peace sign is what we did. We'd put together a peace sign 
out of these these bottle caps. And so we kept getting, remember, I didn't do any drugs before I went to Vietnam. So this is really interesting because for the moment I, I, moment I stepped back on U.S. soil, started doing drugs big time because I learned it overseas in Nam. And so we just wanted more. We want to experience more stuff. So the popular thing back then was LSD, acid. And I can remember my older brother, he was going to Fresno State University, and they were studying about this LSD. I can remember him coming over one night and taking Rick and I aside, and he said, guys, you don't even know what you're doing. Said, what do you mean? This stuff's great. We said, take some. He said, no, let me teach you about this stuff. He said, people are diving out of windows, killing herself. This stuff is really bad. And we, of course, well, that's the best thing we've ever had in our life. Pictures dance. The pictures come alive and the flowers outside are dancing in the flower bed. And this stuff is awesome. Best drug we've ever taken. Get out of here, you nerd. So he left. And of course, we're, we're just taking that acid daily. We're, we're selling Coke bottles to be able to afford it, to buy it. Because, you know, we didn't make a whole lot of money. We weren't doing too well. So we'd sell Coke bottles and get this acid and, and just keep dropping acid. And it was just like really weird. The music would just amplify like a million times in your head. And, and we just kind of got addicted to the LSD now. And we'd taken it all the time. And so back in the day, some of you guys watching this will remember the name Purple Microdot. That's what it was called. It was laced with speed itself, along with the speed we were taking, the whites. And then one night we took this stuff and we went walking down what's called Blackstone in Fresno. And all the lights were going and it was summertime. We'd jump in a canal and throw water up and the beads of water would come down like in slow motion. <laughs> I'm telling you, you guys know all about acid I'm talking about here. So we, we were walking along. We said, oh, let's do something different. Let's take off running. Let's race type of thing. Still 20 years old, you know, like kids. So we took off sprinting down the road, heading towards our apartment, run as fast as we can. And when we stopped, I felt like the top of my head blew off. The rush, the, the rush from paranoia, from all that speed of whites and the speed and acid, all the continu continually addiction of dropping acid all the time just put me on the worst trip anybody could imagine. I mean, I was like gone. And so I had to call my brother and say, take me to the VA. So I went to the VA and told him, so I just had a bad trip on acid. And I have uh, all the records from the VA from that episode from when I first got back. It was like three months after I got back. And I have all the records from them of episodes I went through through the years and would end up there in the VA. From the dysfunction, the drug addiction, violence, rage. I was the most violent, meanest. I was a, not a good person. I was not a nice person. And the way I handled all, all of this stuff from the war was by acting out and violence and all this stuff. And so they said, ah, take all these drugs and you'll be okay. So I left, and of course I did nothing. So Rick and I, we continued framing houses, partying kept going on. And then I, I discovered, I said, dude, you know, I need a little space from each other once in a while, I need a car. And so my friend had a car, it was a 1963 Lincoln. I have a tattoo on my side here, I love that car. It cost me $700, but it was, dumped to the ground. It had spoke wheels, big wide tires, light blue interior. Everything was power. And Rick and I carried a 45 under the seat, under the front seat, because we were we were nuts. I mean, we'd take that acid and we'd go not really looking for trouble, but we were, we were not good people. And so we tried to mind our business most of the time. So when the violence started, was one time we were at Bass Lake, we were hiding what they called jars of pills up there. And we'd, we'd go get them, that's where we hit them. We'd go get them and then we'd sell them. And that's a, how we afforded to feed our own addiction. We would get pills, sell them for a profit, and then we'd be able to take them. 
Well, we were driving back from Bass Lake, I remember. And I don't know, going 65, we, we always were watching for cops because since I was little, I was in juvenile hall a few times. And in jail after that, even before I went to Vietnam a few times. So we knew, you know, how to watch for cops and all this kind of stuff. So these guys pull up beside us and they're, they were trying to pass us or something like that. And no, it was vice versa. We were trying to pass them. And these guys flip us off. For no reason, they flip us off. Dude, did you see that, Rick? <laughs> yeah, yeah, let it go. Because, you know, I was more violent than Rick. I was violent. He was always there. When we get into it, he was there. He'd, he'd get in there and fight and help and everything. But, but I was usually one that would start stuff. So we drive it. He says, I'll let it go. So we floor it and we were going like 100 and we left the way back there. I go, that guy pissed me off, Rick. I'm going to kick his ass. <laughs> he goes, okay. So we slow way down, let him catch up with us. And we head to my brother's house who lived in a mobile home park. And they're flying, they're, they're on us, man. I mean, this is like Duke's Hazard stuff. He's around the corners. We go flying into my brother's mobile home. And I thought, I got, I got drugs in the car. I got to go hide them. So I grabbed these drugs. A couple jars, whites and reds, what they call reds. that were downers back in the day. So we had uppers and downers. When you come down off the whites, you take the reds. That's, it was a never ending cycle. So I run in to hide, hide this dope. My brother, he has a family. He's going, what the heck's going on? I said, dude, don't worry about it. And I grabbed a bottle of beer out of his fridge, full bottle, went out and hit that windshield with that bottle. Bam! As they were driving up, <laughs> splattered all over this guy's windshield and that ticked him off. So he stopped and it was on. <laughs> we're fighting all over my brother's neighborhood. All his neighbors are out there, you know, and we're just, we're throwing blows. I mean, they, they, had, they had, they had just two guys and, and there was me and Rick. So his guys, I knocked this one guy clear over the hood of a car and he's falling on his head and, and they're cussing and we're cussing and baseball bats and just going berserk because we're on dope. We're on speed, you know, it makes you really violent. So finally, my brother goes, the cops are coming, the cops are coming. So, oh, shoot. So these guys jumped in the car and just smoked, smoked the tires down the road and took off. And so that's, that's one of the times that the rage started, started acting out in me. In fact, I have, I have a, one of these papers right here. I went to the VA and uh, some guys came to our house one time with guns. It was over a girl course, different girl, not Debbie. And I got into it with him and I was like stoned out of my mind on the downer pills, not the uppers. So I was like in slow motion. And this guy, so and so, why don't you come outside? And my brother told me. And I said, where is he? <laughs> I'm, I'm ripped, right? <laughs> so this guy, he's getting the best of me, which I wasn't used to. I mean, I was fast when I was young, speed with my hands. I knew how to box. From Vietnam, I learned from a Golden Gloves guy. So I would usually take somebody out pretty quick, just from my fast hands and street street experience and fighting. I fought in bars all the time. So this guy, he's biting me, man. I never had that happen before. And right here it said, what happened to you? It said, chest bite, proof, VA. So this guy's on my chest. And I'm telling Rick, shoot him, shoot that SOB. Because I never had pain like that before. <laughs> Rick come outside with a pellet gun. And these guys had like 38s, 45s. And he's got a pellet gun rifle. And I said, shoot that SOB. And a couple of these guys had just got out of the joint. We learned later. So they, they played for keeps, you know. We didn't know who we were messing with there. So this guy's biting me and he has hair down to here. So I just took his hair, ran his head into the windshield. Rich GTO. And the way I got him off of me, tip for you guys if you steal street fight, I bopped his ears. I said, how am I going get this? I went pow on his ears and that made him let go. <laughs> so when he did, I grabbed his hair and just 
let, send him to the wind chill. Oh, that, that was my life after Vietnam. Don't want to glorify bad, violent things. But that's just two small stories of the dysfunction in where I was living. It was absolutely horrible. So I thought I need to buy a car. And I, I think I mentioned that a little while ago. I need to buy a car. So I went and bought a car from Danny, that, that uh, 63 Lincoln. And Danny was my childhood friend. He was the guy I smoked my first cigarette with. I think it was fifth grade. And whiskey. We drank some whiskey in his garage. <laughs> Danny, Danny didn't like school either. He was as dysfunctional as I was, dysfunctional. So his dad was the head of the VA. I mean, the, yeah, the, the uh, AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, in Fresno. And so Danny was still living with his dad, and they did plastering work. And so I would hang out with Danny, and we would drink until we got what we call alcohol poisoning. We'd just sit in his backyard and just drink pints of vodka every day, just straight hot. And we were addicted to alcohol and pills and everything else. Well, Danny's wife died in his arms in a car accident heading towards Bass Lake. And so he, he was a drinker before that, but he got really, you know, uncontrollable after that. His, his, her parents ended up raising their daughter. And so she died in his arms. So he was, he was all messed up. He had issues big time. And so Danny was one of the places. Eventually, I would, I went back to the, to the VA, I think four different times. It, that was 50 years ago, my memory. I, I have it written down, but I don't know the, the uh, order that all these things happen. But I went to the VA for the last time and I was diagnosed by 12 to 13 psychiatrists. And they said I was criminally, violently insane. And they were gonna send me to a mental institution in Palo Alto over at the coast. And they were gonna do that like within a week or something like that. And I knew I was crazy, but I knew I wasn't that crazy. But they had me, they had 100 milligrams of, of, of uh, Librium at night, along with 50 milligrams of Thorazine, just to sleep. And then during the day, I had all these other meds they had given me. So I was like, I'd go to, I'd go to in the rec room to play ping pong, and everything was like in slow, so stone on Thorazine. You can even hit the ball, you're so out of it, right? And I didn't understand it all because when you're walking through that, you don't think you're what they're saying, right? I mean, anyway, that went on and I sat in that room locked up. Back in the day, they locked you in there. And I thought, you know what, I'm getting out of here. I'm gonna escape from this place. So I did the big great escape. I was in my, my medical pajamas. <laughs> I can remember like it was yesterday. And I thought, I'm getting out of here. Don't know where I'm going, but I'm getting out of here. So I snuck, I did my thing, got in the elevator and, you know, made my way down. It was on the seventh floor, it's called of the VA. And I got down to the door and I just kind of walked out when I thought it was, nobody's watching me. And I hitchhiked across Fresno, California to my friend's house. And I started living in my car because I had nowhere to go. My parents lived in, uh, my mom lived in Visalia and all my relatives lived in Visalia, just about all of them. So I had no one, nowhere to go. I had some friends in Fresno because I grew up there until ninth grade. And so I would drive over to their house and they all knew I was crazy. I mean, you know, the, the reputation we were given non-vets after, after the war is they're all crazy. Them guys are insane. They'll shoot you. They're, they're out of their mind. Well, I was, but but anyway, they'd see you come and they'd lock the door. You know, they didn't want you around their kids because some of these guys were older and had kids, my friends. And so I'd go there and once in a while they'd give me a sandwich or whatever. And so I had this car is about all I had is a car. 
So I would try to get jobs here and there, blah, blah, blah. And I remember one time I would stay in my older brother's garage. I don't want to say this disrespectful, but, you know, I, now that I'm over it and older, I understood why he wanted me in his garage, not his house. This guy's a lunatic, even though I was his brother. And I, I got it. I kept trying to work ever since now. My, the thing I want to do is work. And so I can remember working at this hamburger place. It was in a mall. And this lady trained me for like an hour how to do the cooking. You know, they'd order sandwiches. It's like a little deli in there. Well, she, she trained me for one day. Next day I came to work, she said, handle this. And it was at noon. And she went off in her back room. And I mean, they had these wheels that fill up with the orders, right? I didn't even know what the stuff was, let alone... <laughs> let alone out of you know, the line I can remember was like from here, you know, 50 feet out into the mall. These people were all lined up. And I went to find that lady. I didn't know what the food was, how to do anything. I've been there one day. She's back there half drunk. This woman, I said, I said, lady, you, she goes, no, no, no. That's why I hired you. I said, I said, you know what? Screw you. And I left and but she had no idea my life or what I was going through. And it absolutely crushed me because I felt guilty like I couldn't, I couldn't do even that simple little thing because I was so screwed up. So I went and bought a pint of vodka and I sat down in the gutter. I can remember it like yesterday. And I said, what the, I should just freaking blow my head off. And I downed that bottle of vodka I can remember. And I called my brother, my oldest brother, and told him to come and get me. And, and, you know, and so he came and got me. Of course, I was half drunk. And he said, well, what happened? I don't want to talk about it. So I got to his house, and I went over to my old friend Danny's house. And because I knew he'd have some booze. So I get over, and we're drinking booze. And this other old friend of mine that lived in this place we called Tarby Village, he shows up. And he has hair down to here and a beard this long, and I hadn't seen him in forever because we moved to Visalia. And now he's all grown up. He's like 260, 64, 65. Called him Grizzly Adams. I gave him that, that nickname. And, oh, what's up, man? Let's go up to Bass Lake, hang out, go swimming like we did when we were kids, right? And I remember I had a Levi jacket that had the sleeves cut off, no shirt, no t shirt. Raggedy old Levi's, because I was living in my car, remember, just bouncing everywhere and partying, dysfunctional. And so, Doug, we, we hitchhiked up to uh, Bass Lake. And it was nighttime when we got there, so we're getting drunk, man. We have, he's got, got some money. Let's go to Bass Lake. So you got enough for some wine. So we get some wine, and we get rick, ripped. And we're sitting out in the big old freaking trees, what do you call them, pine trees, and here come some horses with with cops on them. And uh, this Doug guy was a funny guy. When he got drunk, he was so funny. And he goes, look, man, he goes, here comes Columbo. <laughs> what are you talking about? Look, and these dudes had trench coats on back in the day, and they were on horses because we're up Rick Ranger. We're up in the... So they come up, oh, God, Doug, Doug starts saying stuff like that to him, popping off, piss them cops off. They said, turn around, you're under arrest. <laughs> so we go to jail up in the middle of no tiny little jail up there. And, and uh, they tell Doug they're going to let us out the next day. They just wrote us up for public intoxication. Tell Doug, make that baby. Doug says, F. He says, screw you. He says, I've been in the joint. I've been in done time in Fresno County. I don't have to make my freaking bed. He says, you know what you can do? It. And the guy goes, you're not getting out till you do. He says, yeah, I'm getting out. You have to let me out. You don't have any charges on me. You have, you know, drunk and disorder. Like you have to. Okay, you worthless SOB, the cops told me. So they let us out of jail. Remember, we're walking because we hitchhiked there. So we go down to this place called the Pines at Bass Lake. And it's just down the hill from this jail. And so, Doug, you got any more money? Oh, yeah, dude. He buys a big old bottle of, the older guys watching this old now, Red Mountain Wine he bought. 
We didn't care what it's called, as long as you can get a lot of it and get us both drunk, right? So we sat down, and like I said, this guy's so funny. We're sitting down against the wall at the market, and we're drinking a whole gallon of wine. And it's 4th of July, and anybody that knows anything about Fresno Bass, like that, there's like 500 Hell's Angels down in the bar, down the way from us. And I tell Doug, I said, dude, he said, let's go in a bar and, and drink in there. I was like, not going in the bar with them Hell's Angels. Yeah, dude, let's go in there. And I said, when I grew up, seventh grade, there was a place called Cedar, Bowl, Cedar Lane's Bowling Alley in Fresno, California. And all the Hells Angels hung there. And I was intrigued by these guys. Uh, we got to know the president. His name was Grasshopper back in uh, 1964 or three, something like that. And so we knew these guys. We hung out with them. We played pool with them, played songs in the bowling alley. You know, we knew we knew how to act, put that way around them. If you don't bother them, leave you alone. And we were little kids. They thought we were cool, you know, because we... Anyway, what happened to Grasshopper? Well, he went to prison for five years. Shoot. So we're, we're sitting outside this market. Let's go in there, Doug. So we go in there. I go, this guy's going to get us killed. I knew what to do. I went and slid by the old guys at the bar, all the older angels, probably 40 and older. And I was still only 21. But I've been around. I've been in jails. I did some time in, in uh, Sacramento County Jail. And so I know you give the biggest guy your ice cream and they'll watch your back. I remember this guy rolled me a whole pack of cigarettes because I gave him my ice cream. Biggest guy in there. Nobody was going to bother me. And uh, in fact, he went on to Quentin for murder. Guy got life and I saw him get it because when I went to court, he was there too. And back in the day, you wore pompadour and big old hair like that. And the judge would, you have anything to say? I remember that guy just sit there, didn't say a word. Just stared at him like I would kill you if I didn't fight you. So anyway, that's a whole nother story where I got arrested and me and Rick and had physical fights with CHPs and stuff. Whole nother story. But this other story, I'm still back there in, in Bass Lake. We get in there and I slide in there and I'm drinking booze, man. I'm drinking tequila with these old guys and I'm talking to all these older Hells Angels. And there's fighting going on out, out, out on the balcony. And I said, dude, he goes, oh, that's just the pups. They're acting out, out there. The pups, the young guys, they're fighting each other. They're drunk. And they're, Hell's Angels are fighting Hell's Angels. Everything. And so I see Doug. I'm glancing over to see if Doug's still alive, right? He's walking around like his big old lumbering, stupid self. Big old beard down here. And he tells this one, what's going on, brother? To this Hell's Angel. This Hell's Angel you ain't no brother of mine. And three of them big dudes grab him and throw him out on his head, man. He's rolling out in the parking lot. And all these sheriffs come up and he's running up the mountains trying to get away from them. And they're running after him. And they caught him, threw him, threw Doug back in jail. So I lost Doug. He went to jail. And uh, so I ha had to hitchhike back to uh, Fresno because I had nowhere to stay. And I remember going back to my brother's house, my oldest brother's house. And time was going on and there was nothing but violence, nothing but drugs, nothing but ongoing fighting and broken hands, casts all over my hands from fighting and and guys shooting at me, the bar we used to hang out at, you know, and us shooting at other people. People, you know, because we were packing back then and, and uh, we were just crazy. I'll never forget some Fresno State football players came in where we partied in this certain bar. And they're like fish out of water and there. These football players in college going to school. And I remember they pulled up and they were trying to cause some stuff. And uh, this big guy gets out of the car. I mean, we're talking, he must have been a lineman for them guys. He was huge. And he started mouthing off, you know. And so we start mouthing. Pretty soon we're throwing blows with freaking guys as big as this house. No business fighting these guys. But we're drunk out of our mind. And so we take off running. These guys are so big. They're going to kill us. So Rick, I remember running down this parking lot. And I'm coming back this way. 
And when this guy has Rick on top of a car, and then Rick kind of spun him around, and then I'm going, and I'm going to blast this guy, and it was Rick. And he said, no, and he ducked, and I swung and just missed him. And I said, get the gun, Rick, get the gun. We had a Volkswagen then. He went and grabbed a, I think it was 22. That's all it was, but it was a handgun. And you should have seen these football players. I mean, they went dove through the window. Their feet were hanging straight up out like they were, they thought we were going to kill them. Well, we were bluffing. He had a gun, but he, I, well, Rick might have shot him, I don't know. But anyway, I can hear these guys just screaming, get out of here. And so they're smoking your tires all through this bar parking lot. And they, they were like gone. But that was, that was kind of like, you know, uh, a pretty normal thing. If if my bro, if I got to tell this story, I don't care much. I like. If my little brother sees this, uh, he'd probably freak out. But we went in this one bar. We're shooting pool, mind our own business. Of course, getting later, we're getting drunk. Blah blah blah. And these guys, of course, these guys are next to us. I hey, you assholes doing here. What whatever it was. And of course, to me, that's an invitation. What'd you say? Instead of getting my cue stick, just went over the back of this guy's shoulders. Wham! Busted it right in half. My little brother picks up a cue ball and hits this guy right in the mouth. Not like that, but threw it at him. This guy's coming at me. Do it! Hit him right in the mouth. And you can see this guy, he probably lost all his teeth and just blood just went. And so everybody's throwing blows, man. Fighting cue stick punching people, you can hear that crap. And then of course everybody starts screaming, the cops are coming, so we jumped in and took off. Anyway, sorry, Bill, I had to tell that story. But that was it. Fresno is a route that back in the day, they were the leading murder capital in the world. And not the world, in the United States. It was a really violent, violent place. Mongols, angels, blah, blah, everywhere, right? So, um, <laughs> I'm just moving right along here with this violent thing. Uh, I went to the doctor for, for, I broke my hand on this guy's jaw. He'd been bothering me for months. And I had this girlfriend and we met at this bar and my brother and some other friends were around this table. And we were getting drunk and that guy showed up and he was right across from me, like right there. And I kept getting drunker and he kept getting mouthier like he always does. And I remember leaning over to my oldest brother and said, I said, lean back. I'm getting ready to blast this guy. And so he said whatever and I'd come across that table, boom, right square in the jaw and knocked him off the, and Ron, the, the guy that owned the bar, damn it, damn it, what do you do? I said, okay, I'm, I'm good, I'm good. Get the hell out of this bar, I'm good. So we got outside and there must have been 200 people. They make the circle, like what happens. And we start throwing blows and I'm on whiskey, you know, I'm, I'm lit up. This guy was like, my son's side, he's like 6'2". And I would, boom, I said, quick, isn't he? Pow, pow, pow. This guy's face was just like obliterated. I'm busted, I don't even have any knuckles right here. They got buried here so i go to the va i said yeah i punched a wall because i want to get them to pay for it right <laughs> this little squirrely doctor he's pressing on it it's hurting like I just, what are you doing let go of my hand and he goes uh you didn't hit a wall that that's from hitting somebody's jaw i thought how do you know that well, it was true they paid for it anyway but I could sit here and tell these war stories and bar fights that they'd go on for two hours, but I'm not gonna do that. So anyway, uh, I end up living in my car for seven years, seven years. And what I would do is I would drive from friend to friend, their houses, and they'd be cool enough to, you know, tell me a sandwich or invite me in for a beer or whatever. But I never stayed anywhere. I'd always leave because I didn't want to put anybody out. And so I just kept traveling around, traveling around. And 
I got to a point where I, I like kind of hit bottom. I was living, I would live with women. I lived with probably two or three women. One woman had children, a couple of children. And I lost them through, of course, through dysfunction and I couldn't function. I didn't, I was a drug addict, alcoholic. They'd work. They'd come and give me booze and give me drugs and well, it's okay with me. I was like a kept dude, not on purpose, but I, I just couldn't do anything. I couldn't function. Couldn't answer the door. I wore black sunglasses. I wouldn't answer a phone. I wouldn't talk to anybody. I, I was gone. I mean, I had I had like issues you couldn't even believe. And so I kept losing all these women, you know, no one to live with. So I'd be back in my car again, living in the car. Finally, my mom said, why don't you come up and live with us? in Merced, California, and go to junior college and get money from the government. They pay you to go to college. So I didn't have a car then, so she had this big green Plymouth. So all I'd, I'd get up every day and all I'd do is drive around the town and get drunk. And this is right after I'd get out of these little school classes, which I didn't pass any of them. I didn't know what they were talking about. I hated school, I hated high school let alone college, but I was going there to get that little money check thing. And so I can remember I wanted to work for the forestry firefighter, firefighter. So I thought I was 27 years old then, I remember. And I was totally out of shape. So I thought, I got to get in shape, man, because I hear that's pretty hard to become a fireman. So I start running every morning, you know, live with my mom and my stepdad. And felt like I was kind of getting in shape. So I show up for the test at this forestry thing. And these nerds were standing on a big goofy glasses. And, you know, I got straight A's all through high school. I was athletic. I, I loved sports and could that was my best. My best asset was sports. I was physically, I could do an army, 100 pull-ups and all that. And I always aced everything. So I'm standing in line with all these goofy guys thinking, oh, this is going to be a piece of cake, right? So we get in there, and the first thing they want us to do is the step-up thing on this bench. And you had to do as fast as you could for like three to five minutes or something like that. And my body, I didn't know. I smoked three packs of cigarettes a day. And I've been drinking since Vietnam every day if I could find it. And so I didn't realize how bad I would gotten out of shape. So I didn't, I couldn't do it. And I, that was the worst thing that ever happened to me since Vietnam, pride wise. And, you know, they said, you don't, you didn't pass, you flunked. And I can remember that was one of the lowest points because I had just left this woman who had two little children who I was crazy about. And so I was at my lowest part of my life. And then when I flunked that, that was like the biggest slap, like, you know, you're no, you're nobody, you're never going to be anybody. You know, all the Vietnam stuff hit me. And I was sitting on my mom's driveway and I went and got my dad's gun. And it was a 22. And I got attacked by legions from hell. And, and I mean, that, there was no hope. I couldn't, I couldn't win this. This was, I had nothing to live for. I was just devastated. And I go down that river where, you know, catch a trout in the Sacramento River and I drink every day because my mom and I'd steal her medication and take it. And I just ripped all the time. And so I had that gun to my head. And that's my whole purpose in, in these episodes. And my bottom line is to if I can reach one of these guys, one of these vets that has no hope. That's why I'm doing this. But I had that gun to my head and cock. And I, on my father's grave, my mom and stepdad pulled. They were getting ready to pull in the driveway right at that time. And I saw them and I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't have my mom find me like that. So I dropped it like that and, and hid it and went in the house real fast and, and hid that gun. And I can remember, I remember my mom saying, are you okay, son? And I said, what do you mean? She goes, 
are you okay? And of course, they've heard of the Nam vets killing themselves, and she knows what I have been to been through up to that time. And I told her, yeah. I said, I'm okay. And so after that, I had to leave there because that was a bad experience. So again, I get in my car. By then, I had another car, a little 64 Chevy, primer gray, and I headed back to the valley where my friends were and the other parts of my family. And of course, the story goes on. Hi guys, I want to tell, and women, I'd like to tell you guys about uh, a nonprofit, which they didn't have when I got out of Vietnam. There was no way, nothing was in place to find a job. And so I want to tell you about a, non a nonprofit called Hire Heroes USA. And they help you find a job. And it's a great nonprofit. You need to look into it. And I think it would really benefit you. Check it out. Thanks.